everyone for joining our webinar series. My name is Cora McGee. I'm a graduate student at the University of Connecticut studying under Rosa Rodales. So today I'm going to talk about pretty much how to identify the symptoms of pithy rot and leafy greens and also how to some ways of preventing root rot into your hydroponic systems and your leafy greens um, and some biofungicide trials that we did. Um, so let's get started. Today we're going to talk about symptoms of Pythium root rot and leafy green. So here's a photo of some lettuce roots with necrosis on the ends caused by Pythium. Next we're going to talk about the disease triangle, which is a conceptual model that explains how disease develops and using that triangle to try to avoid disease breakout in your system. And lastly, we're going to talk about biological fungicides uh, for root rot and hydroponically grown leafy greens and some uh, trials that we've actually done research on. A little bit about root rot pathogens. So in hydroponic production, root rot is commonly caused by Pythium species, Rhizoctonia species, Fusarium species, and Flaviopsis. So for today's purposes, we'll just be talking about Pythium species uh, that cause root rot in hydroponic leafy greens. Uh, so there's two main species of Pythium that we've actually detected the most hydroponic um, leafy greens, and that would be Pythium affinodermatum, which actually likes warmer temperatures around 75 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and Pythium desoticum that can thrive in cooler conditions such as 60 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Another thing about Pythium species is they love water. So they're actually not fungi, they're oomycetes, so they're water mold pathogens. And, uh, and they're really set up to thrive in water, so that's usually why they're detected uh, in high concentrations in hydroponic systems. So here's a photo of some of the signs uh, of Pythium. So here's some um, uh, Ogonium. And then here is a photo, or a video, I should say, of actually an example of how they survive so well in water. So what we're looking at here is a video of zoospores. So these are, as I would argue, one of the main infecting propagals of Pythium. And they actually have little flagella at the end, so they can swim in nutrient solution. And they actually, zoospores are interesting because they can actually detect um, root exudates coming out of your roots, and they'll actually swim towards your, um, your roots and, and enter via chemiotaxis. So, so they're, um, they're really, really clever uh, little infecting propagals that you should definitely look out for within Pythium species. Pythium is commonly found in hydroponic systems. Pythium species are one of the most common causes of root rot, seed rot, and seedling damping off. Um, and actually, here's a photo of Pythium root rot that was in um, a deep water culture uh, hydroponic lettuce operation. And as you can see, it actually, root rot will reduce the nutrient water uptake um, because the roots get so ne no, so necrotic that root that water and nutrients actually can't uh, be taken up by the plant uh, to a to a degree, and it can usually, you know, result in either death or wilting. So we're going to get into some of those symptoms. So one of the first symptoms that you usually see, or not really first symptoms, but a symptom that you can see more in young seedlings, is damping off. So this is usually like the actual collapse of seedlings. So the first photo is kale, that's a kale microgreen, and here you can see that uh, classic damping off. The middle photo is a lettuce seedling, and then the last photo is an arugula seedling, uh, and as you can see, again, that classic, just the collapse of the seedling. So we call that damping off when it has to do. And then we have wilt and leaf yellowing. So the first photo is a picture of a lettuce in deep water culture, and it's actually wilted. And then the next photo is another photo of a um, lettuce in a hydroponic deep water culture system that actually has a combination of symptoms. So it had wilting and we had detected root rot, I mean Pythium species in their water and in the roots. Uh, however, environmental control kind of played a role as well because they had really high heat, the water was a high temperature. So I think that's a combination of symptoms such as heat stress uh, and root rot. And as you can see, this yellowing um, almost can resemble a nitrogen deficiency. 
reduced growth. So on the left, we have uh, some spinach. That one's old. So on the left, you can see a spinach seedling that we had actually inoculated with Pythium root rot. And then on the right, you can see uh, a healthy, full-grown spinach, uh, about five weeks old. And they're both the same age, so you can really see um, how susceptible spinach is to Pythium. And then we have a photo. Um, Again, on the left is a lettuce seedling that was infected with Pythium. These are three weeks old, both of them the same age. And then the right is a healthy lettuce um, plant. And then on the bottom uh, is actually a commercial facility, so we did not inoculate um, these. But again, you can see that reduced growth, uh, just that drastic difference uh, in the head growth at the same age. So, um, so this is another sign, I mean, another symptom of Pythium. Reduction of root mass is also classic. So the first photo we have mustard. So on the left, you have mustard seedling that has very little root mass, uh, was infected with Pythium. In the middle, same story, we have radish. Um, and then in the end, here we have lettuce. Uh, however, it's flipped. So the picture on the right was the one that was infected with Pythium. And you can see that really, um, that high reduction of root. Uh, you can also see root discoloration as a symptom of Pythium root rot. So, the, so really all photos show, you know, this yellowing, browning discoloration um, of the roots. And also it's really important to look out for that. Uh, in the last photo, you can kind of see a mixture of when the root rot's first starting to set in. You can still see some of those healthy white roots, but then also the browning and the kind of uh, yellowish discoloration. Um, of roots that had been infected with the root rot. So here is a really good photo of um, how Pythium root rot will actually make roots really brittle and easily able to, as we call it, like slough off, so easily break apart. And that's what we like to call rat tail. So that's a classic symptom of root rot Pythium. So the picture is actually the outer cortex easily sloughing off and that inner vascular system is being shown through. Um, so that's another really good way to say like, oh, is something wrong with my roots? Like just more symptoms to look out for. So um, you also kind of want to look for patterns when looking, uh, just kind of getting an idea of what's going on. So here, uh, and it, it doesn't always go for Pythium root rot. You can also see non-uniform patterns um, with other other disorders as well. Um, however, usually with uh, when disease is present, you'll see a more of a non-uniform pattern because it's actually a living organism. So it's not gonna, you know, it's not, they weren't, it's not like when you're controlling for environmental conditions and they were all subjected to the same conditions all like in the same field. Um, so here, this is yield loss due to Pythium outbreak. This is at a hydroponic leafy green commercial facility. As you can see, it's kind of spotty, patchy, um, not not very uniform pattern going on. So the first thing you want to think is like, oh no, so it's not uniform. Um, and what you would honestly, the first thing you'd want to do is send a sample to a diagnostic clinic and get them to diagnose it for you before you take any further steps. Another uh, really key thing you want to check the quality of your plant roots. So uh, the above ground is really important, looking for patterns, but then you also want to actually see what's going on in the roots. So the first photo are really healthy white roots. The next photo are more necrotic brown roots. And these, these roots had actually had Pythium root rot at a commercial facility. Also, like I said, this is a living organism. So it can be non-uniform patterns. So again, like you really want to, symptoms can vary in the same solution. So here's a deep water culture we were growing spinach and I had inoculated it with Pythium root rot and all the symptoms weren't as severe in each pea pellet subjected to the same conditions. Um, so you really, again, want to keep that in mind when scouting and looking for, for uh, issues in your production. Another thing, uh, so you don't, like I said, anytime you see an issue in your production, you really just want to send it to a plant diagnostic specialist, somebody to diagnose it. Um, you know, before you just start throwing products at it or trying to figure it out. Um, I know that's instinctual, but it's, it's, it'll really save a lot of time. So here's a really good story um, about how we went to a grower. And they had already sent 
Uh, they had been seeing these symptoms, this non-uniformity, this like wilting um, within all their different troughs of deep water culture hydroponic lettuce. They'd already sent some samples to a diagnostic clinic and they didn't find anything. Uh, they didn't find pythium root rot, uh, they didn't detect it. So then we actually came to the greenhouse to give it a look and then we started testing the, the water um, for different parameters. So I tested it for free chlorine, I tested you know, the municipal and then actually in the trough. And it turns out all this damage was due to high levels of free chlorine in the water. Um, so again, it's just really important to kind of kind of try to figure out, like get a full picture and try to figure out what's going on and calling and reaching out uh, to specialists to try to, um, to solve these issues. You also don't want to confuse pythium root rot uh, with high salts, uh, and they are a little different in symptoms. So, for example, if you have a really high EC, this was actually um, a graduate student who was trying to grow uh, leafy greens for the first time. I think his meter was broken. So when I came to check it with our calibrated meter, I had checked a pH of 2.2 and an EC of 5.0 millisiemens per centimeter, which is a very high EC, uh, especially for such a young lettuce seedling like this. You really just want to keep an EC like around, you know, even 1.2 when they're young like that. Uh, so basically, here you can actually see that high EC um, symptom, it, it, it's following the veins, you know, you see that like necrosis almost following uh, the veins and, and you usually won't see that with, uh, with pythium root rot. So that, so that can be kind of a telltale um, distinguishable characteristic. And again, I had already touched on, you know, high EC can really cause phytotoxicity in plant tissue as you can see on the left. Um, and pH, I just wanted to say, and I know other, um, webinars will discuss this as well, but, but the nutrients cannot be taken up with a plant if the pH isn't in the optimum range. So if you have a pH of 2.2, the nutrients can be there. However, the plant isn't going to be taking them up because it's not in the right pH zone. So, you know, you're just kind of wasting resources and then you're going to have um, a not so happy plant in the end. So that's another um, just environmental condition to stay on top of. Really, just the takeaway message for this was how to look for symptoms and kind of start to think, you know, is something wrong, what to look for when you're looking for root rot. Um, so damping off, we talked about the collapse of seedlings, wilted leaves, the reduced growth, a leaves appearing dull green or yellow, um, resembling nitrogen deficiency, as I said, it can kind of look like that. Uh, the root discoloration, reduced root mass, and the roots easily breaking apart, as, as that really good photo showed. Um, and again, just kind of considering alternative causes for the problem, I just really want y'all to walk away with um, kind of learning how to scout more often and things to look for. However, still, there still might be other causes of the problem that really resemble the pythium, such as chlorine or the high salt. So all in all, you really just want to start with when you see an issue, sending your samples to a plant diagnostic clinic and getting a specialist to diagnose those samples so you can say for sure, oh, I do have this issue, and then start planning on how to control it or what your next, next steps are going to be. Next, we're going to go a little bit into the disease triangle. So, um, so this is really a conceptual model that explains how disease develops. Um, there's three parts to it. So first, you have your host. Um, so that's, you know, the plants that you're growing. Then you have your environment, you know, what is the temperature like? What's my EC? What's my pH? And then you'll have the pathogen. And when you have all these things coexisting, uh, that can lead to disease development. So in our case, uh, for this presentation, if you're growing hydroponic leafy greens, your host would be leafy greens, um, which currently there's no resistant varieties to pythium root rot out. Uh, so, so they're susceptible to the, to the pathogen, which is pythium. And your environment, which might make this host really conducive for the um, pathogen entering in really high numbers for it to create a disease outbreak would be, you know, low dissolved oxygen, uh, high EC, high temperature, uh, things like that to really stress the plant out uh, and also make a really nice environment for the pythium to come and thrive. Voila, you get your root rot disease. <laughs> There's different ways. I just wanted to show this um, slide just as kind of a quick example of how all these three players really matter in the disease outbreak. So you can kind of use the triangle to think about like how am I going to protect my crop. So yeah, I've got my leafy greens, my environment, um, you know, is, is 
I have my environment set, um, but you know, I've been getting kind of high temperatures, uh, things like that. However, without that, then you don't have the pathogen present, um, then you won't get pathogen outbreaks. And then on the flip side, okay, I've got my leafy greens. Uh, we've been having issues with Pythium root rot. Um, however, I've really been keeping my environmental conditions, you know, to a T. I've been checking pH, EC. So then hopefully, um, again, you won't get the disease outbreak. So, to see what type of environmental conditions make a difference in pathogen outbreak. So here we have a nice, you know, happy hydroponic lettuce plant, and we have different um, environmental conditions that can that can make a difference. So we'll start with the nutrient solution in the blue. So like I had mentioned before, pH plays a major role. You really want your pH in optimum range, so the plant is uptaking nutrients um, at an optimum rate, and it's just happy. Temperature, uh, we had kind of touched on the types of temperature um, that, you know, Pythium dermatum and Pythium desoticum thrive in. However, um, if your plant is kept at a really nice temperature, it's not too hot and it's not too stressed out, which is always the key thing, uh, then, then you should be good. Uh, microbes can also play a big role, such as like, say you amend with biofungicides. Uh, dissolved oxygen is important. So, Hydroponic lettuce really likes a dissolved oxygen around six to eight parts per million. Um, you know, if you're not providing adequate oxygen to the roots, uh, they'll just rot out anyway, whether it was due to pythium or not. You know, you, you really need oxygen for plants to grow. So that's, again, kind of a maintenance uh, take home. Your water source can matter. So it just depends where you're getting the water to grow your plants in. Is that water coming in with pathogens? Um, how are you treating the water? So that can also play a role. Um, again, we had talked about how EC can uh, stress plants out, and, um, and the higher your EC is actually, can actually um, burst some of your cells open. Say you have a really high EC of like, I don't know, like three or four uh, millisiemens per centimeter, uh, that really high EC will actually start um, bursting the root cells, and then that, that root leakage will actually attract those zoospores in there, so you don't want to run that risk. Um, and then also shore flies, fungus gnats uh, are big, or I don't want to say big players, but there is research showing that uh, these insects uh, can actually, you know, digest and transmit uh, certain pythium structures in their gut and things like that in, in different species. Um, and of course, these, these flies and gnats really like feeding on the algae, and then algae overall can kind of stress plants out as well. So just you know, all good things to think about, like just to maintain a really happy, healthy plant. And then also, it's really important to prevent inoculum from entering the system in the first place. Uh, so we're gonna go into each of these topics one by one. So one is surface sanitation. You wanna really inspect your seedlings, make sure there's no issues before, you know, you're putting them in your troughs. Seedling drenches. Uh, and different products to do that with. And then treating your recirculated nutrient solution um, is another one that we're gonna talk about. So sanitizing in between production cycles is really important uh, to stay clean. You know, you really wanna start clean, end clean, it's really important. So you wanna get rid of all infected plants from the system. So any debris, dust, media, et cetera, um, you know, from the ground and, and as, as well as you can clean the trays as well in between cycles. Um, so that, so the picture is a really good example of um, a facility washing their production trays, rafts, um, and then also floors. So before you even sanitize with these oxidizing agents such, such as Sanidate, you really want to make sure all this debris and dust is off the floor and removed because these products won't be as effective as if there is lingering, you know, dust or organic matter on the floor. Um, so you're kind of just wasting products. You really want to start clean um, and then hopefully end clean. Inspected seedlings uh, is really important before you begin because like I said, you know, it really just goes back to starting clean and ending clean. So you want to regularly scout your seedlings before transplanting them in the system for root rot seedlings, you know, kind of go throughout your trays, just look at the roots, make sure they're white and healthy, everything looks good. You don't see any of those damp symptoms that we had talked about earlier. Um, so some good, um, actually seedling root drenches before you transplant in the system, that can also be an option. So um, hydrogen peroxide, 
uh, products such as, you know, Xeritol Oxidate, just read the label and they have recommended um, doses for actually drenching seedlings before putting them in a system. However, really read that label carefully because each product um, has different rates. Uh, however, so that is an option to kind of um, prevent anything forming or things like that. So some water treatment technologies. Um, these are more energy extensive and expensive technologies. However, um, they are really good options for you know water treatment, which is ozone and ultraviolet radiation. For more point treatment, so you know if they're in the reservoir or in the tank that you're subjecting the treatment to, it'll, you know, it'll reduce the inoculum. Uh, there's no residual effect, like if you were using uh, certain chemicals, you know, they won't linger. This is like really, you know, like I said, point treatment, whatever's in the nutrient solution, like it, it, should, um, it should treat for the water. Uh, however, it will not prevent the spread if the inoculum's not in the nutrient solution. So again, it's, it's that idea of really starting clean, making sure the floors are all clean because, you know, you're almost, oh, some takeaways. Uh, Again, reducing inoculum, you want to start clean, you want to stay clean. Um, so all the things we talked about, you want to sanitize, there's water treatments. We'll talk about more water treatments in just a second. I just wanted um, to mention more of those, um, those higher production systems. Plant services, nutrient solutions, humans, those can all be uh, sources of inoculum. So just to think about, you want to manage for the environment, so make sure water parameters are optimum for plant growth. Uh, we talked about dissolved oxygen, ECPH, um, and a few other things. You really want to avoid that high EC, because again, that can cause the roots to leak, and that can be conducive for the pythium to come in and penetrate, and you don't want that. And also inspecting seedlings before transplanting them in the system. Um, that may cause uh, for less headaches in the end when <laughs> you know, it could have, something could have been prevented or a couple were infected, they went in and could cause a bigger issue than needed. So just things to think about um, when trying to deal with how to grow hydroponic leafy greens. So um, there really are only a few options available for hydroponically grown crops. Synthetic fungicides registered, there's currently zero. Um, we had touched on some water treatment options just a second ago, the ozone and the UV. However, you can also use chlorine-based products and hydrogen peroxide. However, these products um, have really high phytotoxicity risks. So we had actually done some trials in our lab where we proved that free chlorine higher than just 0.5 parts per million uh, equal to or higher to 0.5 parts per million in the nutrient solution actually caused phytotoxicity. Um, within the lettuce. And there is some research on hydrogen peroxide, but no research um, pertaining to hydrogen peroxide in the nutrient solution that over 25 parts per million had to do with spraying hydrogen peroxide on the actual foliage um, that caused phytotoxicity. So we're still needed for that. Uh, and then again, we had touched on ozone and some UV radiation, uh, which are also great options for water treatment. So that leaves us with biological fungicides, which could be another option. So what are they? So they're the use of beneficial microbes to suppress the activities and populations of plant pathogens. Um, so a really good way to think about this is good microbes against bad microbes. So I have a really good bacteria that um, suppresses a bad microbe, such as pythium. And these biological fungicides can be derived from natural materials such as plants, fungi, um, bacteria, like I just said, mineral compounds or oil even. Um, so I don't want to say all, but I'm pretty sure almost all of them are um, organically certified USDA, uh, all the bio, like almost all the biological fungicides um, out there. So about biological fungicides against root rot. So they're a preventative option, they're not curative. So if you have root rot in your system and it's already creating damage, these biological controls um, probably won't be too effective. You really wanna start using them as a preventative strategy um, before, before you even see symptoms of root rot. The activity of these microbes also depends on environmental conditions. So you really wanna um, be growing your hydroponic lettuce or leafy greens um, in a healthy, you know, sterile, happy environment, good temperature, pH, EC, um, and then 
these bios should also um, do well as do good as well. And then again, I just want to stress this. After, I just want to stress this: adding biofungicides is not like adding a chemical. So basically, if you walk into your bay and you've got you know an outbreak of root rot, these biofungicides it'll be late for them to be effective. It's it's not like adding a chemical and it being corrected. So I just wanted to kind of stress this. So there are some biofungicides registered for root disease. Um, so there's 20 biofungicides registered for root, desi root disease in hydroponic edible crops. Um, and, of, and that's out of eight species and 14 strains. And here I've added four of the most common um, genus that are registered against Pythium root rot, and that would be Bacillus, Trichoderma, Glioclatium, and Streptomyces. Uh, and they all have like different modes of action, which means, you know, how are they actually suppressing these root diseases? And that can be via competition. So, you know, we know bacteria um, usually in a higher abundance than, you know, some oomycetes or some fungi. Um, mycoparasitism, so that means, you know, one fungus is preying on another fungus. Antifungal metabolites, um, so some microbes can actually secrete uh, toxic compounds that can harm other microbes. So, you know, there's all these really cool modes of actions of how they're actually doing the suppressing uh, of these harmful diseases. And we had actually done some trials ourselves. So uh, we used four different biofungicides against Pythium root rot uh, in a couple different experiments. So this was Companion, Root Shield Plus, Trichoderma harzianum, and a Trichoderma virens, um, Triathlon BA, and Cs. So Companion and Cs were both Bacillus subtilis, uh, however, they were a different strain, as you could see. And then uh, Triathlon BA was a different species of Bacillus, Amlioquiescens, uh, and then Root Shield Plus was two types of fungi. So, um, we did trials with some lettuce seedlings. Uh, the cultivar was Rex. So here on the bottom, you can see all of our treatments. It was either untreated, it had, you know, no biofungicides added. Um, we had companion Rucha Plus, triathlon BACs, and, um, and the plus or minus is whether Pythium was present. We're just looking at, you know, with no Pythium present right now. And then on the side, we can see our dry weights. So as you can see, just looking at this, um, if it didn't have any biofungicides present, it actually had a higher um, biomass. And depending on all the biofungicides that were added as well. Uh, however, if we look at untreated and then we show when it had pythium, we see um, a reduction of growth actually um, really significantly in the pythium. And here's a photo of how drastic uh, that reduction was when, again, no biofungicides were present. Um, the pythium was pretty severe in the lettuce, and as you can see, that, you know, chlorotic reduced growth. However, see, uh, when biofungicides were added, so, so with the companion Rucho Plus Triathlon and Cs, they um, actually had a higher mass compared to if there was no biofungicides treated. Uh, so there's kind of this trade-off, right? So you see the reduction uh, so you see an increase in biomass uh, when pythium's present when you get the bios versus if you don't have bios. So it's kind of you know starting small, trying with your all with your own small trials in your greenhouse and seeing which bio uh, works best for you and your um, crop and your growth. We'd also done a similar trial with lettuce, Spretnik, which is a different cultivar of uh, lettuce seedling, and again same story. Um, if it you know it was untreated, didn't have any biofungicides, but pythium was present. It was still lower biomass than if they had pythium present and had the biofungicides. Um, and I just wanted to show this photo. So here we have Rex on the left, and we have pythium, uh, no pathogen, and then Spretnik. And as you can see, um, the plant still looked pretty marketable, uh, even if there was pythium. So it just depends, uh, you know, how, how you're... So yeah, the plants were still marketable. Uh, so so you just have to think about those trade-offs. And also, you know, just trying them in your own system. Uh, Cause there's a lot of research out there about how biofungicides perform in soils. So we're, 
you know, just trying to get an idea of how they react in more soilless systems, different types of crops. So again, like trying these trials out for yourself may, may help benefit which ones are best. We had also tried these trials with microgreens in an NFP system. So um, again, at the top, we have all of our treatments. The only one that wasn't included was ceased, like we did for the lettuce. So we've got companion root chill plus triathlon VA, and then the untreated, which is actual no, which is no biofungicides included. And here we have a arugula plant. So as you can see, if um, if no pythium was added, then actually the you know no biofungicides untreated plants did really well. Uh, however, with triathlon BA, we saw, yeah, we had, in, we had included pythium, but we had also added a tri the biofungicide triathlon, and we also had really, um, really good biomass and even root mass. Um, so it did show like these biofungicides uh, can work to reduce pythium. Uh, it's just, you know, like I said, like trying your own trials and seeing how they react in your system. And here we did the same thing with spinach plants. And again, very similar results in which we saw, you know, um, if it wasn't treated with biofungicides uh, and it had no pythium, you know, they grew really well, they were gorgeous, uh, as we've been seeing as a trend. However, when we had um, the biofungicides, they actually, um, some of them did something to suppress the pythium and you still get um, nice looking plants uh, and high biomass. And we also, in the um, second run, so that's what the two numbers mean, I apologize for not saying that up earlier, but basically the first row of numbers is the first run of the experiment and the second row is the second run. So what we get is even, you know, pretty good yields from the companion with the Pythium present and same with the Root Shield Plus. So again, um, you know, these biofungicides are having an effect on the reduction of the Pythium. Uh, it's just, you know, testing them with different crops and systems to really see how they perform uh, for your production. Uh, so this is another funny story with biofungicides. So you see the plants on the left in this NFT system. These lettuce plants look, you know, kind of reduced, a little wilted. Um, and then the ones on the right look great. You know, they look happy. So what happened? Uh, what did we add to that? Was it Pythium? No. So... We actually had been trying trials of different biofungicides, and that was actually the control of Pythium. Uh, and this was a biofungicide called Actinovate that, you know, um, created kind of like a slimy mold when you had first like amended it and was um, kind of not letting any oxygen through the roots. As you can see, it kind of just created like a mucilage um, coating on the roots, and it actually um, started clogging, you know, it would clog the pipes, it would clog um, the pump that we had. So again, like no oxygen was getting through, we'd have to be checking them um, constantly. So again, like it's just, I really want you to take home um, from these biofungicide trials, um, you know, there's really no silver bullet to controlling Pythium. You really just have to try different products and different biofungicides at kind of small trials to see what works best for your system, your crop, your environmental conditions, because um, they're all they're all pretty different. But I I do think they can help um, help with the pythium reduction. So again, some takeaway messages. So you want to look for symptoms regularly in your crops. Reach out to diagnostic specialists to identify the issue. Um, that would really help. Just reaching out um, before you just start throwing products at things. Uh, so you can save time, hopefully save money, and, and get down to what the problem is. If you test what's in your nutrient solution, it may help optimize environmental conditions and help identify the problem. So again, you know, these really good um, practices to do, testing your water quality, looking for symptoms and scouting. You always want to catch issues before they get out of hand so they're easier to control. Uh, biofungicides may perform differently depending on your crop, your cultivar, your system. So again, you really want to start with small sections, small trials, see how they work for you. Um, but they, you know, we did show the biofungicides can reduce the negative effects of pythium uh, in lettuce and microgreens. So it's it's really just seeing um, which ones are best for your system. So really, no silver bullet to control pythium. I know you wanted me to tell you exactly how to control it, but you know we're still working on different uh, control strategies. Uh, you want to start with small trials, see which management practices are best suited for your growing operation. Um, so yeah, I really hope. Again, thank you. This event is co-hosted.
This event is co-sponsored in part by USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture, the Hatch Multi-State Project. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you so much for joining all these webinars. Uh, we have more on the way. And, uh, and yeah, thanks again.